Dear friends, before beginning my talk, allow me to extend my warm greetings to you all. For the first time in more than two years, I am speaking personally to you through this video message, which was produced a few days before the 2020 Catholic Identity Conference. As you can see, I am very well, my health is excellent, and I am even better in spirit. This is also thanks to your prayers, to the support and the encouragement I receive from you and from so many friends and brothers from all over the world. Together we are all united in prayer and in the holy battle which we are called to fight each on his own respective front, all gather under the mantle of the Most Holy Virgin, the Queen of the Victories, and under the protection of St. Michael the Archangel. I especially wish to thank Michael Matt, who kindly invited me with holy perseverance to speak to you. I believe that now is an opportune time for me to deliver the following address. The subject of my thought would be how the revolution of Vatican II serves the new world order. We live in extraordinary times. As each of us has probably understood, we find ourselves in a historical moment in time. Events of the past, which once seemed disconnected, prove now to be unequivocally connected, both in the principles that inspire them and in the goals they seek to achieve. A fair and objective look at the current situation cannot help but grasp the perfect coherence between the evolution of the global political framework and the role that the Catholic Church has assumed in the establishment of the new world order. To be more precise, one should speak about the role of that apparent majority in the Church, which is actually small in number, but extremely powerful, and which, for brevity's sake, I will summarize as the Deep Church. Obviously, there are not two churches, something that would be impossible, blasphemous and heretical, nor has the one true Christ Church today fail in her mission, perverting herself into a sect. The Church of Christ has nothing to do with those who for the past 60 years have executed a plan to occupy her. The overlap between the Catholic hierarchy and the members of the Deep Church is not a theological fact, but rather a historical reality that defies the usual categories and as such must be analyzed. We know that the New World Order project consists in the establishment of tyranny by Freemasonry, a, sub, a project that dates back to the French Revolution, the Age of Enlightenment, the end of the Catholic monarchies, and the declaration of war on the Church. We can say that the New World Order is the antithesis of Christian society. It would be the realization of the diabolic Civitas Diaboli, the city of the devil, opposed to the Civitas Dei, the city of God. 
the eternal struggle between the light and darkness, good and evil, God and Satan. In this struggle, providence has placed the Church of Christ, and in particular the Supreme Pontiffs, as catechon, that is, the one who opposes the manifestation of the mystery of iniquity. Second letter to Thessalonians. And second scripture warns us that at the manifestation of the Antichrist, this obstacle, the catechon, will have ceased to exist. It seems quite evident to me that the end of times are now approaching before our eyes. Since the mystery of iniquity has spread throughout the world with this appearance of the courageous opposition of the catechon. Let us not make the mistake of presenting the current events as normal, judging what happened with the legal, canonical, and sociological parameters that such normality would pursue pose. In the extraordinary time, and the present case in the Church is indeed extraordinary, events go behind the ordinary known to our fathers. In extraordinary time, we can hear a Pope deceive faithful, see princes of the Church accused of crimes that in other times would have aroused horror and been met with severe punishment. Witness in our churches liturgical rites that seem to have been invented by Kramer's perverse mind. See prelates process the unclean idol of the Pachamama into St. Peter Basilica. And here the Vicar of Christ apologized to the worshippers of that simulacrum. If a Catholic dares to throw it into the Tiber. In these extraordinary times, we hear a conspirator, Cardinal Godfrey Daniels, tell us that since the death of John Paul II, the Mafia of St. Gallen has been plotting to elect one of their own to the Peter's chair, which later had turned out to be Jorge Mario Bergoglio. In the face of this disconcerting revelation, we might well be astonished that ne neither cardinals nor bishops express their indignation nor ask that the truth be brought to light. I will talk now about the eclipse of the true Church. For 60 years we have witnessed the eclipse of the true Church by an anti-Church that has progressively appropriated her name, occupied the Roman Curia and her dicasteries, dioceses and parishes, seminaries and university, convents and monasteries. The anti-Church has usurped her authority and its minister wear a sacred garment. It uses her prestige and power to appropriate her treasure, assets and finances. Just as happened in nature, this eclipse does not take place all at once. It passes from light to darkness when a celestial body inserts itself between the sun and us. This is a 
relatively slow but inexorable process in which the moon of the anti-church follows its orbits until it over overlaps the sun, generating a cone or shadow that projects over the earth. We now find ourselves in this doctrinal, moral, liturgical and disciplinary cone or shadow. It is not yet the total eclipse that we see at the end of time under the reign of the Antichrist, but it a partial eclipse which let us see the luminous crown of the sun encircling the black disk of the moon. The process that led to the today eclipse of the church began with the modernism, without a doubt. The anti-church follow its orbit despite the solemn condemnations of the magisterium, which in that phase shone with the splendor of truth. But with the Second Vatican Council, the darkness of this spurious entity came over the church. Initially it obscured only a small part, but darkness gradually increased. Whoever then pointed to the sun, deducing that the moon would certainly obscure it, was accused of being a prophet of doom with those forms of fanaticism and intemperance that arise from the ignorance and prejudice. The case of Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre and a few other prelates confirms, on one hand, the far-sightedness of these shepherds and, on the other hand, the disjointed reaction of their adversaries, who out of fear of losing power, using all their authority to deny the evidence and kept hidden their own true intention. They continue to continue the analogy. We can say that in the sky of the faith, an eclipse is rare and extraordinary phenomenon. But to deny that during the eclipse darkness spreads just because this does not happen under ordinary conditions is not a sign of faith in the effectibility of the Church, but rather an obstinate denial of the evidence or bad faith. The Holy Church, according to Christ's promises, will never be overwhelmed by the gates of hell. But does not mean that she will not be or is not already overshadowed by her infernal forgery. The anti-church, that moon not by chance, we see under the feet of a woman in the book of the Revelation. I quote, A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. The moon is under the feet of the woman who is above all mutability, above all earthly corruption, above the law of fate and the kingdom of the spirit of this world. And this is because that woman, who is at once the image of Mary most holy and of the church, 
is a mikta sole, clothed with the sun of the righteousness that is Christ, exempted from all demonic power as she takes part in the mystery of the immutability of Christ, as St. Ambrose wrote. She remained unbruised, if not in her militant kingdom, certainly in the suffering one and the purgatory, and in the triumphant ones in paradise. St. Jerome, commenting on the words of Scripture, reminds us that the gates of hell are sins and vices, especially the teaching of heretics. We know therefore that even the synthesis of all heresies represented by modernism and its updated conciliar versions can never definitively obscure the splendor of the Bride of Christ, but only for a brief period of the eclipse, that providence in his infinite wisdom has allowed to draw from it a greater good. The abandonment of the supernatural dimension. In this talk, I wish especially to deal with the relationship between the revolution of Vatican II and the establishment of the new world order. The focal element of this analysis consists in highlighting the abandonment on the part of the ecclesiastical hierarchy, even at the top, of the supernatural dimension of the Church and his eschatological role. With the Council, the innovators erase the divine origin of the Church from their theological horizon, creating an entity of human origin similar to a philanthropic organization. The first consequence of this ontological subversion was the necessary denial of the fact the Bride of Christ is not and cannot be subject to change by those who exercise vicarious authority in the name of the Lord. She is neither the property of the Pope nor of the Bishop or theologians, and as such, any attempt at aggiornamento lowers her to be level to the level of a company that in order to garner profit renews its own commercial offer, sells its leftover stock and follow the fashion of the moment. The church, on the other hand, is a supernatural and divine reality. She adapts the way she preaches the gospel to the nations, but she can never change the content of one iota, nor deny her transcendent momentum by lowering herself to mere social service. On the opposite side, the anti-church proudly lays claims to the right to perform a paradigm shift, not only by changing the way doctrine is expounded, but the doctrine itself. Insisting on what the Magisterium teaches is useless. The innovator brazen claim to have the right to change the fate stubbornly following the modernist approach. The Council's first error consists mainly in the lack of the transcendent perspective, the result of a spiritual crisis that was already latent, and the attempt to establish paradise on earth with a sterile 
human horizon. In line with this approach, Fratelli Tutti sees the fulfillment of an earthly utopia and social redemption in human brotherhood, Pax Ecumenica, between religions and welcoming migrants. The sense of inferiority and inadequacy. As he has written on other occasions, the revolutionary demands of the Nouvelle Theologie found fertile ground in the Council Fathers. Because of a serious inferiority complex vis-à-vis -vis the world, there were times in the post-war period when the revol revolution led by Freemasonry in the civil, political and cultural spheres breached the Catholic elite, persuading it of its inadequacy in the face of the epochal challenge that is now inescapable. Instead of questioning themselves and their faith, this elite bishop, theologian, intellectual, recklessly attributed responsibility for the imminent failure of the church to a rock solid hierarchical structure, to a monolithic doctrinal and moral teaching looking at the defeat of the European civilization that the Church had helped to form, the elite thought that the lack of agreement with the world was caused by the intransigence of the papacy and the moral rigidity of priests not wanting to come to terms with the zeitgeist and open up. This theological approach stems from the false assumption that between the Church and the contemporary world there can be an alliance, a consonance of intent, a friendship. Nothing could be further from the truth, since there can be no respite in the struggle between God and Satan, between light and darkness. I quote from the Genesis, I put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. He shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. This an enmity will by God himself, which places Mary most holy and the Church as eternal enemies of the ancient serpent. The world has its own prince, who is the enemy, a murderer from the beginning, and a liar, curtain a pact of non-belligerence with the world means coming to terms with Satan. This overturns and perverts the very essence of the Church, whose mission is to convert as many souls to Christ for the greater glory of God, without ever lying down arms against those who want to attract them to themselves and to the damnation. I will talk about the idem sentire of the revolution and the council. The council father's sense of inadequacy was only increased by the work of the innovators whose heretical ideas 
coincided with the demands of the world. A comparative analysis of modern thought confirmed the idem sentir, the same feeling or same mind, of the conspirators with the every element of the revolutionary ideology. I leave the description of these comparative details in the written version of my lecture. When this anti-church is fully established in the total eclipse of the Catholic Church, the authority of his leaders of the anti-church will depend on the degree of the subjugation to the new world order which will not tolerate any divergence from its own creed and will rationally apply that dogmatism, fanaticism and fundamentalism that many prelates and self-styled intellectuals criticize in those who remain faithful to the magisterium today. In this way, the deep church may continue to bear the trademark Catholic Church, but he will be the slave of the new order thinking. Reminiscence of the Jews who, after denying the kinship of Christ before Pilate, were enslaved to the civil authority of their time. We have no other king than Caesar. Today's Caesar command us to close churches, wear a mask, suspend the celebration under the pretext of pseudo-pandemic. The communist regime persecutes the Chinese Catholics and the world hears nothing but silence from Rome. Tomorrow a new Titus will sack the council temple, transporting his remains to some museum, and divine vengeance at the end of the pagans will have been achieved once again. I will talk now of the instrumental role of the modernist Catholic in the revolution. Some might say that the Council Fathers and Popes who presided over the, that assembly did not realize the implication that their approval of the Vatican II documents would have for the future of the Church. If this was were the case, it is, if there have been any subsequent regrets in their hastily approval of equivocal texts or texts close to heresy, it is difficult to understand why they were unable to put an immediate stop to abuses, correct errors, clarify misunderstandings and omissions. And above all, it is incomprehensible why the ecclesiastical authority has been so ruthless against those who defended the Catholic truth, and at the same time was terribly accommodating to rebels and heretics. In any case, the responsibility for the conciliar Christ must be laid at the feet of the authority, which even amid a thousand appeals to collegiality and pastoral pastoralism, has jealously guarded his prerogatives, exercising them only in one direction, that is, against the Pusillus Grex, the little flock, and never against the enemies of God and the Church. The very rare exceptions when a heretic theologian or revolutionary religious has been censored by the Holy Office 
only offer transit confirmation of a rule that has been enforced for decades, not to mention that many of them in recent times have been rehabilitated without any abjuration of their errors and even promoted to institutional positions in the Roman Curia or Pontifical Athenaeums. This is the reality that emerges from what I have described above. However, we know that in addition to the progressive wing of the Council, and the traditional Catholic wing, there is a part of the Episcopate, the clergy and the people, that attempts to keep equal distance from what it considers two extremes. I'm talking about the so-called conservatives, that is, a centristic part of the ecclesiastical body that ends up carrying water to, for the revolutionaries because while rejecting their excesses, it shares the same principles. The error of the conservatives lies in giving a negative connotation to the traditionalism and placing it on the opposite side of progressivism. The aurea mediocritas via media consist in arbitrarily placing themselves not only between two vices, between virtues and vice. They are the ones who criticize the excesses of the Pachamama or the most extreme Bergoglio's statements, but who do not tolerate the Council being questioned, let alone the intrinsic link between the conciliar cancer and the current metastasis. The correlations between political conservatism and the religious conservatism consists in adopting the center, a synthesis between the right thesis and the left antithesis, according to the Hegelian approach, so cherished by moderate supporters of the Council. Now we talk about open society and open religion. This analysis would hardly be completed without a word on the neo-language so popular in the ecclesiastical sphere. Traditional Catholic vocabulary has been deliberately modified in order to change the content it expresses. The same has happened in the liturgy and preaching, where the clarity of the Catholic exposition has been replaced by ambiguity and the implicit, implicit denial of dogmatic truth. The examples are endless. This phenomenon also goes back to Vatican II, which sought to develop Catholic version of the slogan of the world. Nevertheless, I would like to emphasize that all those expressions that are borrowed from secularistic lexicon are also part of the new language. Let us consider the Bergoglio's insistence in the outgoing church, the openness as a positive value. Similarly, I quote from Patelli Tutti, a living and dynamic people, a people with a future is one constantly open to a new synthesis through its ability to welcome differences. 
number 160. I quote again. The church is a home with open doors. We must to be a church that serves, that leaves home and goes forth from its places of worship, go forth from its sacristies in order to accompany life, to sustain hope, to be the sign of unity, to build bridges, to break down walls, to sow seed of reconciliation. Close the quotation. Similarly, with the open society sought after by Soros' globalist ideology, is so striking as to almost constitute an open religious counterpoint to it. And this open religion is perfectly in tune with the intention of globalism from the political meeting for a new humanism, blessed by the leaders of the church, to the participation of the progressive intelligence in green propaganda. It all chases after the mainstream thought in the sad and grotesque attempt to please the world. The stark contrast with the words of the apostle is clear. I quote from the Epistle to the Galatians. Am I now trying to win the approval of human being or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. The Catholic Church lives under the gaze of God. She exists for his glory and for the salvation of souls. The anti-church lives under the gaze of the world, pandering to the blasphemous apotheosis of man and the damnation of souls. During the last section of the Second Vatican Ecumenical Council, before the Synod's fathers, these astonishing words of Paul VI resounded in the Vatican Basilica. I quote, The religion of God, who became man, has met the religion, for such it is, of men who make himself God. And what happened? Was there a clash, a battle, a condemnation? There could have been, but there was none. The old story of the Samaritan has been the model of the spirituality of the Council. A feeling of boundless sympathy has permeated the whole of it. The attention of, of our Council has been absorbed by the discovery of human needs. And this need grow in proportion to the greatness which the Son of the Earth claim for himself. But we call upon those who, terms, who term ours, themselves modern humanists and who have renounced to the transcendent value of the highest realities to give the Council credit at least for one quality and to recognize our own new type of humanism. We too, in fact, we more than any other honor mankind. This sympathy is the figure of the Council. 
and of the new religion, for such it is, of the anti-church, an anti-church born of the unclean union between the church and the world, between the heavenly Jerusalem and the hellish Babylon. Not well. The first time a pontiff mentioned the new human humanism was the final session of the Vatican II. And today we find it repeated as a mantra by those who consider it a perfect and coherent expression of the revolutionary men's frame of mind of the Council. Always in view of this communion of intent between the new world order and the anti-church, we must remember the global compact on education, a project designed by Bergoglio and promoted in collaboration with the United Nations, I quote, to generate a change on a planetary scale so that education is a creator of brotherhood, peace and justice. An even more urgent need in this time marked with the pandemic. A close and quote. This project has been supported and spread to all educational institutions by the Congregation for Catholic Education through a letter that makes explicit reference to the conciliar constitution Gaudium Espes. The Global Compact on Education, I quote, is a process of formation in the relationship of culture of encounter also finds space in the value of common home with all creatures, people, just as they are formed to the logic of communion and solidarity, are already working to recover serene harmony with creation and to configure the world as a space of true brotherhood. Close the quote. As can be seen, the ideological reference is always and only to the Vatican II. Because only from that moment on did the anti-church place man in the place of God, the creature in the place of the Creator. The new humanism obviously as an environmental and ecological frame into which are graft both the encyclical Laudato, Laudato Si and the green theology. The church with an Amazonian face on the 2019 scene of a bishop with his idolatrous worship of Pachamama in the presence of the Roman Sinedrin. The Church's attitude during the COVID-19 demonstrated on one hand the Iraqis' sub submission to the dictates of the state in violation of the Libertas Ecclesiae, which the Pope should have firmly defended it also put on display the denial of any supernatural meaning of the pandemic, replacing the righteous rap of God, offended by the countless sins of humanity and nation, with the more disturbing and disturbing fury of nature, offended by the lack of respect for the environment and I would like to emphasize that attributing a personal identity to nature almost endowed 
with intellect and will is a prelude to her divinization. We have already seen such a prelude of this under the very dome of St. Peter Basilica. The bottom line of this conformity on the part of the anti-church with the dominant ideology of the modern world establishes a real cooperation with powerful representatives of the deep state, starting with those working toward a sustainable economy involving Jorge Mario Bergoglio, Bill Gates, Jeffrey Sachs, John Elkham, to mention a few. Allow me a brief word about the political situation in the United States on the eve of the presidential election. Fratelli Tutti seems to be a form of Vatican endorsement of the Democratic candidate in clear opposition to Donald Trump. And a few days after Francis refused to grant an audience to Secretary of State Mike Pompeo in Rome. This confirms which side the children of light are on and who the children of darkness are. I'm talking now about the ideological foundation of brotherhood. The theme of brotherhood, an obsession for Bergoglio, find itself first formulation in Nostra Etate and Dignitatis Humane. The latest encyclical, Fratelli Tutti, is the manifesto of this Masonic vision in which the cry Liberté, Egalité, Fraternité replaced the Gospel for the sake of a unity among men that leaves out God. Note that the document on human fraternity for world peace and living together signed in Abu Dhabi on February 4, 2019 was proudly defended by Bergoglio with this word. I quote, From the Catholic point of view, the document did not go one millimeter beyond the Second Vatican Council. I close the quote. Cardinal Miguel Ayuso Guisot, President of the Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue, comments in the Civita Cattolica. I quote, The Catholic Church commitment to interreligious dialogue, which opens the way to peace and fraternity, is part of her religious mission and at its roots in the Council event. I close the quote. Once again, the Council of Vatican II confirms that it is at the origin of Bergoglian metastasis. The Phil Ruse, the common thread that unites the Consul with the cult of the Pachamama, also passed through Assisi, as my brother Athanasius Schneider rightly pointed out in his recent speech. And speaking of the anti church, Archbishop Fulton Sheen describes the Antichrist, I quote, since his religion will be brotherhood without paternity of God, he will deceive even the elect. Close the quote. We seem to see the prophecy of the venerable American Archbishop coming true before our eyes. It is not surprised that the infamous 
Grand Lodge of Spain. After having warmly congratulated his paladin race to the throne, once again paid homage to Bergoglio with these words. I quote, Pope Francis' latest encyclical shows how far the present Catholic Church is from its previous positions. In Fratelli Tutti, the Pope embraced the universal brotherhood, the great principle of modern Freemasonry. Close the quote. The reaction of the Grand Oriente of Italy is not dissimilar. I quote. These are the principles that Freemasonry has always pursued and guarded for elevation of humanity. Close the quote. I remember that in the Masonic documents of the Alta Vendita since the 19th century, an infiltration of free masonry into the church was planned. I quote, you too, will fish some friends and lead them to the feet of the apostolic see. You will have preached revolution in Tayara and Cope, proceeded under the cross and banner, a revolution that will need only little help to set the quarters of the world on fire. I will talk now of the cause and effect. Philosophy teaches us that to a cause always correspond a certain effect. We have seen that the action carried out during Vatican II have had the desired effect, giving concrete form to that anthropological turning point which today has led to the apostasy of the anti-church and the eclipse of the true church of Christ. We must therefore understand that if we want to undo the harmless effect we see before us, it is necessary and indispensable to remove the factors that caused them. If this is our goal, it is clear that accepting or even partially accepting those revolutionary principles would make our effort useless and counterproductive. We must therefore be clear about the objective to be achieved, order in our action to the goals. But we must all be aware that in this work of restoration, no exception to the principle are possible, precisely because failure to share them would prevent any chance of success. Therefore, let us put aside once and for all the vain distinction concerning the presumed goodness of the Council, the betrayal of the will of the Synod Fathers, the letter and spirit of Vatican II, the magisterial weight or lack of death of, of his act, and the hermeneutic of continuity versus that of rupture. The anti-church has used the label ecumenical council to give authority and legal force to its revolutionary agenda, just as Bergoglio calls his political manifesto of alliance to the new world order an encyclical letter. The cunning of the enemy has isolated the healthy part of the church, turning between having to recognize 
the subversive nature of the Council document, thus having to exclude them from magisterial corpus, and having to deny reality by declaring them a politically orthodox in order to safeguard the infallibility of the magisterium. The dubia represented an humiliation of the princes of the church, but without untying the doctrinal knots brought to the attention of the Roman pontiffs. Bergoglio does not respond, precisely because he does not want to deny or confirm the implied errors, thus exposing himself to the risk of being declared heretic and losing the papacy. This is the same method used with the Council, where ambiguity and the use of imprecise terminology prevent the condemnation of the error that has been implied. But the jurist knows very well that, in addition to the blatant violation of the law, one can also commit a crime by circumventing it, using it for evil purposes. Contra legem fit, Quod in fraudem legit fit, the Latin will say, what circumvents the law is against it. To conclude, the only way to win this battle is to go back to doing what the Church has always done, and to stop doing what the anti-Church asks of us today, that which the true Church has always condemned. Let us put our Lord Jesus Christ, King and High Priest, back at the center of the life of the Church, and above that, at the center of the life of our communities, of our families, of ourselves. Let us restore the crown to our Lady Mary Most Holy, Queen and Mother of the Church. Let us return to celebrate the traditional holy liturgy worthily and to pray with the words of the saints, not with the rambling of the modernists and heretics. Let us begin again to sever the writings of the fathers of the church and the mystics and to throw into the fire the works imbued with modernism and immanentic sentimentalism. Let us support with prayers and material help the good priests who remain faithful to the true faith and withdraw all support from those who have come to terms with the world of his lies. And above all, I ask you in the name of God let us abandon that sense of inferiority that our adversaries have accustomed us to accept. In the Lord's war, they do not humiliate us. We certainly deserve every humiliation for our sins. No, they humiliate the majesty of God and the bride of the Immaculate Lamb. The truth that we embrace does not come from us, but from God. To let the truth be denied, or to accept that it must justify itself before the heresies and errors of the anti church, is not an act of humility, but of cowardice and pusillanimity. Let us be inspired by the example of the holy Maccabees martyrs before a new Antiochus who asks us to sacrifice to idols and to abandon the true God. Let us respond with their words, praying to the Lord. So now, O Sovereign of the heavens, send a good agent to spread terror and trembling before us. By the might of your arm, 
may the blasphemers who come against your holy people be struck down. Let me conclude my talk today with a personal memory. When I was apostolic nuncio in Nigeria, I learned about a magnificent popular tradition that came out from the terrible war in Biafra, and which continued to this day. I personally took part in it during a pastoral visit to the Archdiocese of Onitsha, and I was very impressed by it. This tradition, called Block Rosary Children, consists in a gathering of thousands of children, even very young ones, in each village or neighborhood for the recitation of the Holy Rosary, to implore peace. Each child, holding a little piece of wood, like a mini altar, with an image of Our Lady and a small candle on it. In the day leading up to November 3rd, I invite everyone to join in a Rosary Crusade, a sort of siege of Jericho, not with seven trumpets made of ram's horns sounded by priests, but with the Hail Marys of the little ones and the innocents to bring down the walls of the deep state and of the deep church. Let us join with little ones in the block rosary children, imploring the woman clothed with the sun that the reign of Our Lady and Mother may be restored and the eclipse that afflicts us shorten it. May God bless this holy intention.